So I, for one, I love camps. And so when I talk about that, it gets me so excited. And the reason is because I began to really know Jesus and Jesus got my attention at a summer camp. It was uh, at the end of my senior year and I went to a camp with the sole purpose of having fun. I did not care about Jesus whatsoever. And so I had, I'd say three goals going into this camp. One, don't get sunburnt. Two, don't get in trouble with the youth pastor. Like just don't swear in him, uh, swear in front of him no matter what, you can't do that. And then three, uh, I gotta find a girlfriend, okay? <laughs> Only number two happened, but praise God for Oliveira and my wife, who's about to give birth in three weeks. Praise the Lord. But it's the same kind of transformation where it's like the first night, I literally could not give a rip about anything. I'm joking with my friends. I'm making fun of people raising their hands. And the last night, I'm just like, Jesus, I love you. And I'm crying. It's just ugly. Cry. It's gross. And my friends were all arm in arm, just singing kumbaya, praises to God, making all these promises about all these things that we're going to do and all the sins we're going to forget when we get down this mountain and, and, and making these promises to God and feeling the call to go into ministry. And so at, by the end of this camp, I'm literally stoked out of my mind on Jesus. It was great. And start, right after that, I, I go into college my freshman year, and I decide that I'm going to study business and theology. And so I'm excited, going to go into ministry, going to learn all about the Bible. And I start my, my, my first semesters, and I take a New Testament class. I take a class on world religions. And I'm really excited to learn all about the Bible and all about Jesus because I don't know a lot. And I get in there, and I begin to hear some things that I would describe as peculiar. I get in there, and I hear a professor say, God is a woman. Huh? What? Anybody here, you're like a skeptic by nature. I have an internal, what I call my baloney alarm, where when I hear something that's whack, like I hear like, oh my gosh, I have a long lost cousin who's a Nigerian prince who wants to send me money if I just give him my bank account information. The baloney alarm tends to go off a little bit there, right? So I'm in this class, and it's going, wee -hoo, wee -hoo. God's a woman. G Jesus actually never existed. Uh, we actually can't trust the Bible whatsoever because it was written 300 years after Jesus. All this weird stuff. Oh, all religions are the same thing. They all lead to the same God. And I'm a baby Christian. So like something in me, like I'm like, this can't be right. It, if, if it is right, it goes against my entirety of my faith. But this is a professor who I feel like I'm supposed to trust. And so I, I don't entirely know what I'm supposed to believe in this moment. Um, a couple with that, I had a lot of friends who weren't Christians. They were uh, agnostics or spiritual, and, and we had some great conversations, but they would ask me questions that I frankly had no idea how to answer. And since I didn't know how to answer that, I figured my doubt must be right. And so I began to doubt my faith, but so much to the point where my doubt became a crisis of faith. I didn't just doubt my faith. I, I, I was thinking this is, whole thing is a sham. Christianity's bogus. I, 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 my, these last few months have been a waste of time. The hope I have for the future is not true. And I fell down a depressive and anxious episode. I isolated myself from the church. I, 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 pushed, I pulled away completely because I did not know what to believe. And, and it took me months and really like over a year of searching through the evidence and looking at who Jesus is and coming out on the other side of that, battling that doubt and being certain that like, yo, God is real, the Bible is true, Jesus really is the son of God, he died for my sins. And, and it's given me like a really fun opportunity that I really love because it's given me the ability to talk through with some of our youth about doubt because the statistics show 65% of Christians are going to doubt their faith at some point in their faith journey. They're going to doubt something, whether it's their salvation, the, re, the, the trustworthiness of the Bible, who God is. They're going to doubt. But most of the time, we don't talk about doubt. In, in the, the big church, Capital C Church as a whole, doubt is, one of, I think, like one of the least talked about topics because we're ashamed of it. We commonly think that if I tell somebody that I'm doubting, they're going to think, one, I'm not a Christian, two, I have such little faith, or they're just going to give me a half-effort answer. Bro, just trust God. Dude, just stop doubting. Have you tried praying some more? And we, we've heard that a million times. We don't want to hear that anymore. And so usually we are ashamed to talk about our doubt. But the reality is most people are going to doubt. And it, and it comes in many shapes and forms and sizes. Maybe it could be an intellectual doubt. You have a conversation with maybe, say, someone who's a Muslim, and they say that Jesus never claimed to be God. And, and then you start to doubt, did he? You hear an atheist begin to debunk God, and you begin to go through that, and you're wondering, does God really exist? 
Or it could be a sense of emotional doubt you feel. Something happened to you that triggered an emotional response that has colored your view of God and reality. You've witnessed somebody who loves Jesus and, and is so Christ-like suffer horribly, and you wonder, where is God in all of this? Or, or maybe even worse, you haven't witnessed that. You've experienced it. You, you've fallen into cycles of sin over and over and over, and you begin to doubt, there's no way I can be saved. The enemy get, begins to slip in a sliver of doubt, like, you're not a Christian. A Christian wouldn't do that. And the doubt begins to creep in. I want to talk about doubt today, but, but before I do that, I want to I give a brief definition, okay? Doubt is not a sin. Something we need to know here today before we get into this. Doubt is not a sin. Unbelief is a sin. And, and here's the difference. Doubt is a matter of the mind. Unbelief is a matter of the will. Doubt says, I'm trying to understand this. I'm grappling with this and trying to reconcile this with my faith, and I don't understand Faith says, or unbelief says, I understand and I reject that and I refuse to believe that. And so unbelief is a sin and it really it's the unforgivable sin because if we continue in unbelief, we will not pursue Jesus in faith and ask for forgiveness. But doubt is not a sin. And so I want to talk about doubt today. Can we do that today, church? Okay. I'm going to be in Matthew chapter 11. If you want to go there, we're going to throw it on the screen. It says in Matthew chapter 11, verse 1. After Jesus had finished instructing his 12 disciples, he went on from there to teach and preach in the towns of Galilee. When John, who was in prison, heard about the deeds of the Messiah, he sent his disciples to ask him, are you the one who is to come, or should we expect someone else? Jesus replied, go back and report to John what you hear and what you see. He says, the, the blind receive sight, the lame walk, those who have leprosy are cleansed, the deaf hear, the dead are raised, and the good news is proclaimed to the poor. Blessed is anyone who does not stumble on account of me. As John's disciples were leaving, Jesus began to speak to the crowd about John. What did you go into, out into the wilderness to see? Did you see a, raid, a reed swayed by the wind? If not, what did you go out to see? Was it a man dressed in fine clothes? No, those who wear fine clothes are in king's palaces. Then what did you go out to see? A prophet? Yes, I tell you, and more than a prophet. This is the one about whom it is written, I will send my messenger ahead of you who will prepare your way before you. Truly, I tell you, among those born of women, there has not risen anyone greater than John the Baptist. Yet whoever is least in the kingdom of heaven is greater than he. Okay, so background info on John. John is a prophet. He's the first prophet that the nation of Israel had in about 400 years. You had Malachi wrote the last book of the Old Testament. 400 years later, you have John. John, if you look at him, he's like the weird uncle, okay? Uh, John is, um, lives in the wilderness, and he wears camel hair, and he eats locusts and wild honey. I don't know why. Maybe it's paleo. Not really sure. Uh, I have the feeling if you went near John, he'd try to sell you on an essential oil pyramid scheme, but it's not in the text. Maybe I'm reading into that. Um, but John was a prophet who was prophesied about in the Old Testament. The Old Testament foretold about John, and that's what Jesus is quoting here. Isaiah prophesies about a thousand years before this and says, I'm going to send a messenger who will prepare the way before the Lord. John had a ministry to go to Israel and prepare them for Jesus' coming. And so he's in the wilderness. He's preaching, hey, guys, you need to turn back to God, like, now. And, and then he starts baptizing people as a sign of them turning to God. And so when John would do that, he's making the way for Jesus. And then Jesus walks up to John, and John is literally stoked out of his mind. I think the Greek says that. I'm not sure. But literally stoked out of his mind. And he says, yo, behold, it's the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. He, I'm not even worthy to untie the straps of his sandals. He must become greater. I must become less. I baptize you with water. He'll baptize you with the Holy Spirit. And at that moment, John's ministry is done. He made a way for the Lord. Now it's time for him to just get out of the way for the Lord, right? So John is hyped. He, he announced everybody, hey, oh, Jesus is here. He's the Messiah. He's God's anointed one. But John couldn't keep his mouth shut. Anybody relate to that? There is this king who is in an illegitimate relationship. He divorced his wife, married his brother's wife, who also happened to be his niece. Weird. And John calls that out, rightfully so, because that's weird. And the king doesn't like that. He gets John and throws him in a dungeon. Now, I want you to picture this dungeon. Don't picture county jail. 
This dungeon makes County Jail look like a Hilton Garden Inn with a free continental breakfast, okay? It's nasty, there's rats, there's no running water, no sanitation, it's all dark, and he's isolated. And John is in this prison, and he's chilling. He's fine. He looks at the Old Testament prophecies that talk about Jesus where it says stuff like, hey, he will make his enemies his footstool or the entirety of the nations will be his inheritance. John is expecting Jesus to overthrow the Roman Empire, overthrow this king, make his own kingdom. And it says in the Bible that, that the Messiah will, the, the evil kings will feel his wrath. So John's like, all right, this king's just going to feel Jesus' wrath. I'm waiting. But then a day goes by. And, and then a week goes by. Oh, yeah, he's coming. Any day now. Any day now. A month. A couple months. Nothing. John had expectations of Jesus and what he would do, that Jesus, but Jesus had a different plan. And because of that, John had unfulfilled expectations of who Jesus was. And you couple unfulfilled expectations with the suffering he's feeling in this moment. It's a recipe for doubt. And suddenly the one who's like, hey, everybody, Messiah's right here, is now like, guys, can you ask him if he's really who he said he was? I bet some of us can relate. Where we're like, did I get it wrong this entire time? And maybe you, you came here by chance. And you've grown up in the church, and you're like, is, is everything I believe my whole life, have I been wrong about that? I want to tell you this. If you look at John, he's not an ordinary person, Okay. Jesus says he's more than a prophet. If, if anybody, of anybody born of women, he's the greatest. He's literally him. He's literally the goat. And he doubted. And if the goat doubted, what makes us think we have too much faith to doubt? If the greatest of all time had doubts about who Jesus was and was honest about it, what makes us think we can't be honest about our doubts? What makes us think we just have to put on a face and say, doing good, brother, the Lord is good, he's in control, when you're dying inside? What makes us feel like we can't be honest about our doubts? Let me tell you, you are not a bad Christian for encountering doubts. John encountered doubts. Paul encountered doubts. Peter encountered doubts. Moses encountered doubts. David encountered doubts. 65% of Christians doubt. You're not alone. God is not ashamed of you right now. He wants you to know that there's grace, but he doesn't want you to stay in this doubt. It's okay, but he doesn't want you to stay here. He wants to use this doubt to draw you into deeper understanding. And this doubt that you are feeling, whether it's about your salvation, whether, about God, whether, whether it's about God's love, whether it's about God himself, can either be amazing for your faith or detrimental to your faith. It depends on how you respond. So, so how do we respond? Let's look at verse two. When John, who was in prison, heard about the deeds of the Messiah, of Jesus, he sent his disciples to ask him, are you the one who is to come, or should we expect someone else? John's, John was confused, but his immediate response was to go to Jesus. He, he's already isolated in prison, and, and he could have isolated himself further. He could have just hid in the corner and tried to figure it out all on his own. His disciples would come and say, hey, John, how are you doing? And he would just not want to talk to them. He, he could isolate himself if he wanted to. But John knew the solution was not to retreat. It was to press on. John knew that the solution was to go to Jesus instead of away from Jesus. Very commonly, when we are having some sort of doubts about our faith, the most common response is to retreat. I can't tell you how many times I've noticed a youth student who ha doesn't come as much to youth, and, and when they do come, they're not as engaged. They, they, they're not as engaged in worship, they're not enga as engaged in the message, and they seem down. And after really kind of pursuing that and having that conversation, I see that doubt was the root of all of this. Because doubt will tell us that, uh, one, we need to retreat because if anybody found out, they would judge you. They would tell you you're not a real Christian. They would tell you to just have more faith. They would tell you to, that you're just not praying enough. They would tell you you're not saved. Or we have this impression that if we pursued God, we'd get rejected as a result. Or we just think, hey, maybe this isn't even true, so why would I waste an hour of my Sunday coming here if it's all pointless? Can I tell you the solution is not retreat? Let me tell you why. The Bible says the devil ro roams around like a roaring lion seeking whom he will devour. Now, I love 
like Animal Planet. It was Shark Week last week. It's great. I love his podcast. It talks about like animal attack survivors. That's my jam. And I, I've watched enough to know that the lion goes for the gazelle that strays from the herd. The lion goes for the gazelle that's vulnerable. We have strength in numbers. This is why the writer of Hebrews says, don't give up the habit of meeting with one another. Don't give up the habit of coming on a Sunday. Don't give up the habit of being in a via friends because there's strength in numbers. When we are isolated, we're not falling into spiritual formation. We're actually falling into spiritual deformation. We need to be surrounded by Jesus's church because we can't be close to Jesus if we're not close to Jesus's body, which is the church. And here, here's why. The solution for doubt is faith, right? Somebody's like, yeah, Einstein, I know that. I'm trying to have faith. The solution for doubt is faith. But we most often misunderstand the substance and the process of faith, the substance and the method of faith. Faith is not something I can just make happen. I can't just choose to stop doubting and, and let faith rise up. I, I can't create faith with willpower. I can't create faith by the power of positive thinking. I can't just suppress these doubts. Okay, the Bible says uh, in Hebrews chapter 12, verse 2, we are fixing our eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith. Okay, an author will take a blank page and write out a novel. He'll take nothing and create something. Create, have nothing and create a masterpiece. Jesus, in the same way, will see our nothingness and create a masterpiece of faith within us. We cannot create faith. Jesus creates faith. It says elsewhere in, he, in 1 Corinthians 12 that uh, faith is a gift. A gift isn't something I create for myself. A gift is something I receive from another party. Faith is something we receive from the party of Jesus. It's not something we create on ourselves. And so if we want faith, we want to overcome our doubt, we have to be in close proximity to the author of faith. We can't expect the airdrop at 100 miles away. Airdrop doesn't go that far. you got to be in a close proximity for it to work. So we need to be connected to the source of life. Jesus gives this imagery of a vine. He is the vine where the branch is. If the branch is cut off from the vine, it can't do anything. You need to be connected to the vine if you want to grow your faith. And so our response then is to stay close to Jesus Stay close to the body of Christ. And what does that look like practically? It looks like having a devotional life. Even if it starts with 15 minutes in the morning, waking up just a bit earlier, getting into God's word because God has spoken to us. It looks like having a prayer life. I, I think a lot of us are operating uh, just because of a lifestyle of hurriedness and, and uh, all the things going on. We can be operating on spiritual malnourishment. Intermittent fasting is cool, but like just eating on Sunday is not. You need to be eating throughout the week, and the Bible is your food. Jesus says you can't live off bread alone, but on every word that comes from the mouth of God. And so we need to be reading the word. We need to be connected to the body of Christ, whether that's serving, whether that's uh, pl being plugged into a via friends, whether that's going to core. And so I encourage you, if you're new here, go to intro right after this service. Learn a little bit more about that. So our response is to pursue Jesus, not to retreat. And everything in us might be telling us to isolate ourselves. But let me tell you, among God's people, there's no judgment. Among God, he's not going to judge you for your doubt. We pursue Jesus. We don't retreat. So that's our response. Then what does, how does Jesus respond to that? In verse 4, Jesus replied, go back and report to John what you hear and see. The blind receive sight. The lame walk. Those who have leprosy are cleansed. The deaf hear. The dead are raised. And the good news is proclaimed to the poor. John went looking for answers, and Jesus gave it to him. He, he, and I think I see three things in this text that Jesus gave John as his response to John's confession, as his response to John seeking for answers. And I think that the three things, if you're taking notes, that, that Jesus gives us to help us in our doubt. Number one, Jesus points John back to his word. Okay, Jesus isn't doing a show and tell lesson where it's like, hey, I brought my lizard to school for, for show and tell. He's not saying, look at all these cool things I've done and then you'll believe. He's directing John to what's called fulfilled prophecy. 
Okay, people in the, in the Old Testament spoke by the power of the Holy Spirit and foretold something that was going to happen. And Jesus is saying, hey, it happened right now. And so as he's saying, hey, the blind see, the deaf hear, the, the lame walk, the lepers are cleansed. John would remember Isaiah chapter 35 where Isaiah said, when the Messiah comes, this exact thing would happen. And, and when Jesus says, hey, look, the, 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 the poor have the good news preached to them. John, remember Isaiah chapter 61 where Isaiah says the same exact thing. Jesus is saying, hey, John, read Read your dang Bible, dude, and it'll show, it'll show you, it'll point you to me. The entirety of the Bible points to Jesus, and that's why we need to go to it. Here's the reason why. God wants you to trust him. When we are doubting, we're not trusting God, but God wants you to trust him. You can't trust somebody if you don't know them. I'm not going to put my credit card info right there because I don't know some of y'all. I don't trust you that much yet. But if I knew you, Say, here, go, go to 7-Eleven, take my card. You, you have to know somebody to have the ability to trust them. Let me tell you, God isn't calling you to blind faith. If God was calling you to blind faith, he wouldn't have given us the Bible. But God has given us the Bible so we can see his character, see his nature, and then trust him as a result of that. And so, are, are you doubting who Jesus is? I'll challenge you, read the, read the Gospel of John, see who Jesus says he is. Are you doubting how God can allow this thing to happen to you? Read Romans 8 and see what life looks like in the spirit. Are you doubting your salvation and you, you fall back into this sin? They say, there's no way I can be saved. Read the book of Ephesians and see how the work is completed. Are you doubting if the Bible can be true? Look at the prophecies that were fulfilled. Dozens and dozens of prophecies about Jesus. The likelihood of one person fulfilling those is literally mathematically impossible with how improbable it is. So we can look at that and say, oh, I, I can see that this, this has a supernatural component to it. We go to the word. And Paul says this, Romans 10, 17, faith comes from hearing the message and the message is heard through the word about Christ. We get faith when we hear and read the word of God. And God begins to show us how trustworthy he is, show us how good he is, so then we can trust him. Second thing, I, I, I love how... Jesus doesn't like just answer John's question. He says, hey, hey, Jesus, are you the Messiah? And Jesus says, go, yeah, duh. You, you said it earlier, I mean, come on. He gave him the evidence he needed to believe the answer. He pointed John to the evidence he needed. Again, God's not against blind faith. Jesus is the way, the truth, the life. He gave us the spirit of truth. Jesus called the word, which means the logos, the word we get the logic from. Jesus is the logic and reason behind the universe. All logic, reason, and truth point to Jesus. He's not opposed to that. He's not afraid of the evidence because it all points to him. And it reminds me of the story of Thomas, who was a disciple of Jesus, who followed Jesus for three years, saw miracles, heard the teaching, saw it all. But then as soon as Jesus was crucified, all the fear and all the doubt crept in. And, and, and Thomas did the opposite of what I'm saying to do. He isolated himself. And we know this because when Mary and the women came, they say, hey, we found the tomb empty. All the disciples raced there except for Thomas. And then Jesus appears to the disciples. He gives them the great commission. And all the disciples are there except for Thomas. And they're telling Thomas, like, Jesus is risen. It's amazing. you got to see it. And he says, unless I can see and touch the, the, the holes in his hand or see and touch the wound at his side, I will never believe some of you might feel like you're in the same position. I've gone to church my whole life. I come here on Sunday and I hear the good news, but, but I am doubting my salvation. I am doubting if Jesus is really there. I am doubting if God can answer my prayer. And until I see the proof, I will never, ever believe. I love what Jesus does, though. He, he appears in this room unannounced, uninvited, just comes, and he says, hey, Thomas, how you like them apples? Okay, see this? And he says, hey, touch the wounds in my hand, touch the wound on my side, do not unbelieve, but believe. I can't tell you, if you are doubting, if you are, even if you're running from Jesus, Jesus is running after you. Jesus is pursuing you, even when you want to isolate yourself from him. And he is not only pursuing you, but he's pointing you to the evidence, and the evidence that is found in his death and his resurrection. This was the big thing for me. When I was doubting many times, okay, whether it was the intellectual doubt, whether it was when I was stuck in a cycle of addiction and sin, uh, I, I would question my salvation, question if God really loves me, if he chose me. When I go to the cross and when I go to Jesus, that answers all questions and answers all doubts. When I'm wondering, God, do you love me? 
I can look to the cross and say, Jesus died for me, the ultimate act of love. Or I can say, God, am I really saved? I keep falling into this sin. I'm not perfect. What, what am I supposed to do? There's no way I can be a Christian. Jesus will say, look to my wounds. I was the perfect one, not you. And I died so that you could have my righteousness. I died for your sins. If you're doubting if Christianity is real, if you're doubting and you're skeptic, we look to the resurrection, the most well-attested fact in all of human history. You know, we have more reliable sources about Jesus and his life and more well-documented, trustworthy sources than any other ancient document in history. It's the most well-attested fact, in my opinion. And any naturalistic explanation for the resurrection of Jesus falls short. We have evidence such as eyewitness sources within just a few years of Jesus' life. We have hymns that were circulating within a year. We have uh, the transformation of James, who was Jesus' half-brother, who honestly thought he was a bit of a lunatic and then became the pastor of the Jerusalem church. You have Paul, who's out here murking Christians and then sees Jesus and then writes half the New Testament. You have the testimony of the empty tomb, which there is no body found in there, found by three women. You have uh, the disciples who could not have stolen the body. They were about to pee their pants. They were so scared that they were next. And suddenly had a total 180 flip where they went to the nations preaching boldly that Jesus had risen from the dead to the point where they were willing to be hated, put out of society, beaten, mocked, flogged, brutally murdered, had uh, spears stabbed in their side, crucified upside down, boiled alive in a pot of boiling oil for a message they believed. Can I tell you, nobody will do that for something they know is a lie. They had to be telling the truth. The crucifixion and resurrection of Jesus is the most well-attested fact in history, and that's all we need for Christianity to be, to be true. Amen. And so whenever we're doubting something, we look to Jesus. If I'm doubting this is real, I look to Jesus. If I'm doubting if my eternity is secure, I look to Jesus. And the last thing he gives us is the call to faith. I'm going to finish up here real quick. When he says in verse 6 to John, he says, Blessed is anyone who does not stumble on account of me. Blessed is anyone who does not stumble on account of me. I could read this and I'm like, I don't really understand what that means. But if you look at the context of the situation, okay, many Jews in this time were offended by Jesus because they had these expectations that Jesus was going to overthrow the Roman Empire, and yet he didn't. And so they were wondering, okay, what am I, what am I supposed to do with this? And so they would be offended. They'd reject Jesus. John was tempted to do the same thing. He is doubting because of his situation, and in your doubt, there is a temptation to throw away the faith and reject that. And what Jesus is saying is you will be immensely blessed if you continue close to me and you continue in this faith. Don't fall away, John. He's calling him to faith. The beauty of the Christian religion, the Christian faith, is that if Jesus did rise from the dead, that means Christianity is true. If Christianity is true, that means there is a loving but holy God who created this universe, and he created you. And when he created you, he gave you this thing called free will, which is the ability to choose, because love requires choice, okay? God did not want a bunch of RC, remote-controlled robots out here. He wanted people he could have a relationship with. And so, a relationship requires choice. He gave you a choice. But with that choice, every single one of us, every single one of us has chosen ourselves, chosen evil, chosen anything but God. And God is a perfect, holy judge. And as that perfect, holy judge, he must punish wrongdoing and punish evil. And if all of us have done evil, we all are guilty. And G uh, God as a perfect judge says every single, punish, uh, every single sin will be punished and will be paid for. It is a debt that will be paid for. But the beauty of it is, is that we should all have to pay for it ourselves, but we don't have the money to pay that debt. And so we would have to pay for our sin for eternity because we offended an eternal God. If I step on a bug, that's minor consequences, right? If I accidentally kill an animal, say I hit it with my car, that's a little bit more consequences. If I kill a person, major consequences. If I kill a, a, a somebody who it would be capital punishment, like say a, a world leader, that'd be major, major punishment, depending on who the crime is against, dictates the severity of the punishment. When the crime is against an eternal holy God, the punishment must be eternal and holy. And so that punishment must be served for eternity in hell by the sin giver, or the sin, the one who did the sin. But Jesus, the beauty of the Christian faith is that he knows we cannot outwork that debt, so he paid the debt for us. 
He lived the perfect life for us and then calls us to faith. And the way we get that is not through perfection. The way we get that is through faith and trust in who Jesus is and his payment for our sins. Can I tell you, if you, whether you're a Christian or not, God is not calling you to be perfect. He is telling you, I already was perfect for you because I know you can't be. He's saying, by faith, accept my sacrifice for your sins, and I will see you as my perfection. You know, if you're a Christian, Jesus, God can only see you through the lens of the cross of Jesus. He doesn't see you as filthy. He doesn't see you as your sins. Your sins are washed white as snow, and he sees you with the exact same righteousness as Jesus has. And so let me tell you, if you are doubting Jesus, and you, are, you feel like, hey, God can't use me right now because I'm doubting, that is a load of baloney. If you feel like God can't use me, I can't serve, I can't get more involved, I need to keep a distance because I don't have it all figured out, can I tell you, you're never going to have it all figured out, but trust the God who does. If you go to science, if you go to any other faith, they won't have all the answers either. Jesus does. So if you're doubting, continue to take that step of faith. We're going to have a class here in, in, I think, September on apologetics and thinking through the logic of faith like can i really believe god exists how do i know that how can i know i can trust the bible how do i know jesus rose from the dead and i would encourage you to i would invite you to take that whether you are a christian or or you're just trying to figure this whole thing out but let me leave you with this this final message if you are a christian continue to press in don't let doubt keep you in the prison don't let doubt keep you on the on the outside continue to press into jesus and let him give you the faith and then if you are not a Christian, you have a decision to make. Is the evidence for Christianity, or are you gonna take it or leave it? Who is Jesus? Read the Gospel of John, see who Jesus says he is, and believe in the Gospel, believe in the good news that Jesus died for your sins and your doubts. Why don't you stand, we're gonna get into worship, I'm gonna pray. Jesus, I thank you for your grace and for your goodness. I thank you that you meet us where we're at. That Jesus, you don't expect us to, uh, to climb all the way to you. You first went to us. You don't expect us to rise to where you are. You humbled yourself to where we are. I think of uh, Jairus in Mark 9, how he prays, God, I believe, help my unbelief. I feel like most of us have a, a battle inside of us. We're praying for a miracle. We're praying for a breakthrough. We're praying for peace. But there is a little bit of unbelief seeping in. God, would you help cure our unbelief? I pray for the ones battling with doubt. God, would you give them assurance? Would you show them evidence? Would you give them peace on who you are? I pray for the ones going to college where their faith is gonna be challenged. Would you give them peace and would you give them strength in their convictions of who you are? I pray for those that are doubting their salvation and doubting their security. God, would you show them that you have paid it all and every sin past, present, and future is left on that cross. I thank you for your grace. I thank you for your goodness. Would we depend on that today in Jesus' name?